It's my pleasure and honor to have the chance to interview Dennis Sullivan and Jim Stashev about uh, well, their role in homotopy theory in general, maybe more specifically something about rational homotopy theory and about A infinity and L infinity. So I wanted to start by asking both of you how you first got involved in rational homotopy theory. What led you there? What made you think it would be worthwhile? So whoever would like to start. Dennis? Well, I had a specific problem mm -hmm. to show that the automorphism group of a finite complex might be an arithmetic group. So I asked somebody, what is the definition? Mm -hmm. They said, you need a rational algebraic group. So where am I going to get a rational algebraic group? And then I heard about Quillen's theory of rational homotopy theory. So mm -hmm. I looked at it, didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. So I said, maybe it has something to do with differential forms. Mm -hmm. So I got started thinking about it, yeah. And you got, were able to solve the problem that you started yeah. with? Yeah, and then in the way it gave a kind of a, a pretty simple illuminating picture of Postakoff systems and homotopy theory. It gave a sort of something you could understand. Yeah, so. And really compute with. And you could compute things and, yeah. So, I'm lucky, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Jim? Well, I've been very lucky, too. I think what got me at least deep into rational homotopy theory was Steve Halperin. Oh, yeah. I forget how we first came together, but uh, I remember he came to visit me when I was in Chapel Hill. We had already known each other for some time. And we started working again on a specific, though much narrower problem about the obstructions to homotopy equivalences. Mm -hmm. Between what? <laughs> two different <laughs> two different spaces two oh, different oh, with the same cohomology with the same rational cohomology oh, okay. right. actually an important distinction was whether you want to assume the rational cohomology just as vector spaces as greater vector spaces structure. or with the ring structure right that makes a big difference I mean, there's an interesting point here that uh, topology is really made of discrete things and so you can't really kind of smoothly morph from one to the other. But when you work over the rationals, that's like an algebraic thing. And so things form varieties. Mm -hmm. So then you can deform one to the other. So one of the things you did is made a deformation theory. Right. 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 So later, building out of that work with Steve Halperin, <clears throat> my colleague at Chapel Hill was uh, Mike Schlesinger. His office was right across from mine. And the way we got started was there was a particularly simple resolution of an ideal, which was the same as a very simple Sullivan model. And so, well, we figured we had something in common. And over many, many years, it finally appeared on the archive, a uh, version of deformation theory for rational homotopy types. Mm -hmm. With a given cohomology ring. With a given cohomology ring and a specific isomorphism right. augmentation. The structure. Yeah. Right. right. So that's how I got into rational homotopy theory, whereas I'd been in A-infinity structures long, long before. Right, so I intend to come back to right, talking about A-infinity structures. Um, sort of continuing along the vein of rational homotopy theory. So, Dennis, uh, many years ago you wrote a letter to me about the roots of rational homotopy theory when I was writing this history of rational homotopy theory. And one thing you wrote was, any reasonable geometric construction on spaces... You're not supposed to refer to those letters, no. <laughs> can be mirrored by a finite algebraic one. So maybe what? Excuse me, what? Any reasonable geometric construction on spaces can be mirrored by a finite algebraic one with minimal models. Right. And moreover, the manner in which a closed form, which is zero in cohomology, actually becomes exact contains geometric information. Right. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on those ideas? And particularly, maybe particularly the second one, the manner in which a closed form, which is zero in cohomology, becomes zero, contains geometric information. Well, uh, I'll give an example. All right, yeah. great. Uh, so, <clears throat> one day I walked into Phil Griffith's office, because I was at MIT and he was at Harvard and the, nearby, so and I said, I don't know what a Kähler manifold is, but it has infinitely many implications in its rational homotopy theory, and the reason is when you look at a Kähler manifold and look at its differential forms, <clears throat> it has this structure. Some of them are holomorphic. Mm -hmm. And the way the forms multiply is exactly the way the uh, 
cohomology classes, they represent multiply. So if you have two cohomology classes represented by holomorphic forms, mm -hmm. and the cohomology classes product is zero, then the forms are actually zero. So now you can take, the theory says you can derive this extra information out of the way things are zero, mm -hmm. but now there's zero, autom they're actually oh, zero, the yeah. so then all these ways which you can derive more information, I haven't said what it is exactly, there's infinitely many ways, they all have to give zero if you're a Kaler manifold. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what it is, but it satisfies infinitely many implications. Mm -hmm. So that was, and then there's a theorem that in fact, if you, like in this theory that uh, Jim was just talking about, when you deform the homotopy type given a cohomology ring, there's one canonical point in that space where all this further information is zero. Right. And the Kähler manifolds illustrate that point. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. That's kind of an, an answer about the complement of what you ask about. Mm -hmm. But still. Okay. But to pick not everybody's a Kähler manifold. I mean, no. it's a very special <laughs> thing. Yeah. Right. But to pick up on the. Uh, information that it can be hiding. Mm -hmm. The most obvious example is the uh, massy products. Mm -hmm. You have products of classes that are zero, but the way they vanish is exactly what gives rise to the massy product. True. And there's a nice example of that, actually. In Massey's orig original paper, he actually draws the Borman rings. These are three circles. You can make them out of, if you, I'm old enough to have changed diapers with safety pins. <laughs> you can make them out of three safety pins. Mm -hmm. You put safety pin this way and one this way and then the other one down like that. Right. So they're all linked. But any two of them are not linked. Right. And when you look at the cohomology of the complement, and the, all the products are zero because they're not linked. That measures the linking number. But this Massey product he was just referring to mm -hmm. is non-zero, showing that they're simultaneously linked. Right. So it's that kind of information. Right. Great. Great answer. And that was in Massey's original paper. Right. right. Very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. No, that's lovely. So maybe we can move on to infinity type structures here. So um, uh, I, in, there was an exchange of email I was sort of among the three of us while we were preparing for this, and Jim said that at some, p at some point, someone referred to you as Mr. A infinity, you and Mr. E infinity, or right. something like that. So <laughs> I thought this interview could sort of be the story of L infinity by Mr. A infinity and Mr. E infinity. <laughs> Very <But> good. <laughs> so, Jim, could you ex maybe explain to us a little bit the roots of your work on A infinity structures? First the date. What? First the date. The date. The date. Well, it was the degree was awarded in 1961. It was my uh, two theses. Uh, the publication is 1963, and it basically was a problem that was handed to me by John Moore, uh, but in a very open-ended sort of way. And the point was the fact that operations up, well, the most familiar example to most mathematicians would be the Poincaré's version of the fundamental group, where the composition uh, paths by running around one first and then the other. Uh, if you have three in a row, the result is not the same because you parameterize things differently. But it's easy enough to gradually shift the parameterization so the operation is homotopy. That's A, B, and B times C is equal to A times B, C. The associative, okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, level of the homotopy classes, but if you look at the actual loops, what you get is A times B, C, and A, B times C differ by a parameterization, which, as you commented, can gradually be shifted back from one to the other. So you have homotopy associativity. The context in which Moore handed me the problem was just the simple one of when a primitive cohomology class on an H space or more likely on a loop space, yeah, on a loop space, um, when was it actually, could it actually be de-looped? De and so the problem was to figure that out. Mm -hmm. In the process of working on it, um, I gradually saw that the higher homotopies, that is, if you, the homotopy I just described, the three elements, if you do it for four by threes in a row, it turns out there are five different ways to do it. Those five paths are not the same, again, by a suitable 
uh, reparameterization homotopy, you can fill in the whole Pentagon. And from there on, it just blew up. The rest is history. The rest yeah. is history, <laughs> right. Usually we get as far as the Pentagon and say, wow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. All right. Do you, is there more you would like to say about that? or something? Well, that's, that's the... So the, the outcome was that the A-infinity structures, which mean all these higher homotopies, so I think that was one of the earliest occurrence of a whole infinite family of higher and higher homotopies. Well, this, there's Steenrod's diagonal. Okay, right. fair enough. Right. For commutativity. Right. Right. Is he your advisor, Steenrod? Or no, Moore? not at all. Moore was my advisor. And mm -hmm. Moore was Steenrod's student? or No, no Moore was Whitehead, George, George Whitehead's student. George Whitehead, okay. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't think I'd ever gotten my thesis past Steenrod. He was such <laughs> a stickler for right. <laughs> Details. There are famous stories, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. <laughs> right. like so the, what it ended up being was that it, the idea of being a loop space is not a homotopy invariant statement. It's a topological statement. Mm -hmm. So when is a space of the homotopy type of a loop space? Mm -hmm. The answer is if it has an A infinity structure, subject to mild connectivity conditions and right. that sort of thing. Right. right. So this was before we actually had operads in order in oh, to do and it. How. a long yes, time, yes. yes. So much year, years later when Peter May came up with this whole idea of operads, which was basically invented to consider iterated loop spaces. Right. Actually, I had looked at the problem one stage down. If I have a loop space with this A infinity structure, when is it that it um, would in fact be a double loop space? Right. And I started work that out in this explicit combinatorial version that had been so successful for A infinity and it was just grinding to a halt. Mm -hmm. Then years later Peter May came along and managed to globalize the situation so to speak and that was the introduction of operands. Okay, great. I'd like to comment uh, Yeah. because you left off what I think is one of the greatest contributions to that first thing which is you formulated it as when is a space homotopy equivalent to a loop space? And right. you gave this structure. But I'm, I like these clothes that come structure that say structure on the back. Yeah. <laughs> I believe in structure. So okay. you're actually, there's an A infinity structure. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you put that on a space, and if you have another space that you like that's homotopy equivalent to that space, you can transport the A infinity structure over. Right. That is, I think, when all is said and done and a thousand years have gone by, I think that is really the main idea. You can. See, you can't transform a Lie group structure by a homotopy right. equivalence. You can transform an A infinity structure and get a structure over here. That's right. So I think that, and uh, I'm going to mention it in my talk actually, is that this idea of transferring structures, you can imagine a continuous problem like a PDE or something, and you want to compute it. So you grid your space down and transfer the structure that's describing the PDE in an infinity form down to the grid, and then you get a lot of formulas that you can try to compute with. So it's that transfer, which is sort of what I find remarkable. Yeah. So just one amplification of that, in that particular case, you started with, so to speak, a strict structure, and by transferring it, you were you get involving things, all these higher things. Right. This is exactly what happens in the typical application of the A infinity, you start with a strictly associative thing mm -hmm. and a space that's only homotopy equivalent to it, and as you say, but the transfer process of necessity is almost always going to create higher homotopies. Right, right, right. Well, that's, you know, so the cuts, yeah. And those higher homotopies are also like this higher information that we talked about before in the Massey products. I mean, it's right. all part and parcel of oh, the same absolutely, idea, absolutely. Yeah, hierarchies. Yeah. yeah. Well, moving on from A infinity right. to L infinity. So when did the L infinity story start? Well, I, can, I reviewed my own history at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In this same paper with Mike Schlesinger about rational homotopy theory. Which was, what years are we talking here? Uh, the early eight, the original work was done in the 80s. I think we even published a actually published a brief summary back then mm -hmm. and the point was that by using non-minimal but otherwise right. Sullivan models right. we were able to classify homotopy types. In particular this involved this huge 
differential graded Lie algebra. Mm -hmm. But then I remembered a result of Kadishvili's in the A infinity case, which says if you have an associative algebra with a differential and you look at its homology, then you can actually trans again transfer the strictly associative structure to an A infinity structure on the homology. And I thought, well, we're dealing with differential graded Lie algebras. It ought to work the same way. And lo and behold, it did. So that was the first exposure to L infinity. Then, within a few years, I happened to go to a uh, the last uh, grand unification theory, otherwise known as GUT, which was taking place in Chapel Hill. And I went to a talk by uh, Barton Swebach, who was doing closed string field theory, and lo and behold, I was seeing formulas that looked like an awful lot of, like an L infinity algebra. Mm -hmm. uh, the grading was kind of fluky, but that was probably some physical assumption. Yeah. <laughs> and then shortly after that, um, a young, I'll say more about this in my talk this afternoon, but very briefly, a young a PhD candidate from the Netherlands was visiting one of his supervisors who was at Chapel Hill, and the same sort of thing happened. He started to describe his work, and I was seeing his formulas, and then I'd say, and the next term looks like this? And he said, yeah, how'd you know? <laughs> and it was L infinity again. Uh -huh. And for you? Uh, uh, well, the I don't remember when the name came along, except um, <clears throat> uh, there's a lot of thoughts, but... Uh, one thing was, well, I was in a, a situation when I had something that I knew didn't satisfy Jacoby, and, uh, but it sort of almost did. So then I wondered if there was an analog to A infinity for Jacoby mm -hmm. identity. And, uh, but I, didn't, wasn't, I wasn't used to writing formulas and stuff. I didn't really pursue it directly. Uh, but anyway, something uh, happened in algebraic geometry where the deformation theory could be described in each affine chart, but they didn't fit together exactly, only up to homotopy. And then they made a global object, which turned out to be the infinity structure. And they came to the seminar at CUNY, talked about that. So that's what I, and then when he finally said, well, what is a infinity? And he said, oh, it's a differential on a free differential, on a free grading free differential. Well, I know about those things. Yeah. <laughs> And that, that but, but wait, there's an important point that hasn't been said yet, because, right. again, it's structure, mm -hmm. not the formulas. But see, in fact, it's sort of due to Kinsevich, I would say, that even, I mean, kind of, that these, uh, like these free differential algebra that you see in rational homotopy theory, the fact that that can be viewed as a structure on the linearized variables or on the cohomology and, and the meaning of the structure, mm -hmm. That gave a new, that was from the 90s, that's 20 years after the rational homotopy theory was flourishing already, right? So that's like giving it a, an interpretation of, this, of these objects as being sort of infinity versions of a Lie algebra. And of course that Lie algebra is, is like the base loop space in some sense, right? But, so there's an important, even, so nothing changed in the, it's sort of like what the speaker yesterday was saying, nothing changed in the computations, but there's some, some perspective that changes that that you can view the uh, the object say of rational homotopy theory as being some kind of structure mm -hmm. on a chain complex and that chain complex can be transferred around in this transfer theory so it gives a different perspective and that's the part of it. So that was uh, not it didn't seem to be known before the 90s even though the theory was around Mm -hmm. The computation were being made, but this idea of a structure. Yeah. It, it's still not completely <laughs> absorbed into the community, I think. What? I, I don't think this idea has been completely absorbed into no, the community. No, I don't think so, either. right. And, and, and the it's fact a there, yeah. very important perspective, I agree. Right. right. But to pick up on your reference to perspective, uh, there are two ways of describing an L infinity algebra. Just there are two ways of describing a Lie algebra in terms of the Jacobi identity or in terms of the Chevalier Eilenberg complex. Well, you do the same thing for L infinity originally, you know, with all these complicated formulas, which I'll try to make a little sense out of in my talk. But, you know, you st anybody who's coming to it cold looks at those formulas and say, what the heck's going on? Right. But if you do the Chevalier-Allenberg trick or its equivalent, you get 
a single differential. It happens to be on a co-algebra rather right. than an algebra, uh, but it's free. Come out of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think of the dual, years later the light bulb goes off in my head and says, oh, that's Solomon. <laughs> right, right. But it, perspective was lacking. No, it. perspective is different. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. So, what does it really mean for a DG Lie algebra or an L infinity algebra to control deformations? Uh, I mean, we talk a lot about this. is a very popular idea these days. Right. Lay algebra is controlling deformations. Right. So, what can we say? How how can the, someone interpret that? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I, I only know it in terms of formulae. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I think the first. Well, maybe not the first, but at least a famous example is when, well, Spencer and Kodaira were trying to generalize what Riemann did to the deformations of, Riemann did the deformations of the Riemann surface structure on a genus G surface, got 3G minus 3 parameters. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to generalize that, and they did it for complex manifolds. And they got, they could start deforming the structure, and then a deformation would try to, they were forming a formal power series of deformations, and then Kodaira, when they actually could do it, proved they were convergent and actually got deformations. But there was a formal cal sequence of calculations, and uh, the infinitesimal deformation, well, I've learned from Barry Mazie the following thing, that the tangent space to anything is H1 of the anything with coefficients in the sheaf of infinitesimal automorphisms of the anything. <laughs> okay? So you always know what the tangent space is for anything. Mm -hmm. And then you take an element in the tangent space, you can find the first, the linear term in your formal power series, then you look mm -hmm. to try to find the second one. You get a dx equals y. The y is a bracket of the first two things, always. Mm -hmm. It's a bracket with itself, so it's an odd thing. And then you solve that, and then, then try to find, that will give you, if you can do that, you get the quadratic term. And then the cubic term is always it's like a massy bracket, a massy product. It's, it's the bracket of that first thing with the thing that made the, sec the first one zero. So there's this universal form of the obstructions to deforming things, and you start seeing that. Gerstenhaber, when he did his, that's got it right, right, when he did his deformation for associative algebra, he was trying to make it algebraic. He said, let's do Kodaira Spencer algebraically by deforming mm -hmm. the, the ring of functions. We could, oh, we can do associative as well as commutative. And he gets the same mm -hmm. sy system of equations. And so I think that's what someone like Deline is the one who formulated this phrase, mm -hmm. controlling a deformation problem. But it's a universal computation. It's like you're doing a Taylor series, and you get these derivatives. And, and the Lie algebra is coming in mm -hmm. because they're infinitesimal changes of coordinates. Mm -hmm. So that's, Just to put so a that's, how I, that's all I understand about it. Right. Yeah. Just to put a little more history into yeah. it. First of all, I think it was Kobayashi who first uh, actually showed the convergence. Oh. That's a minor historical point. More right. to the point, the only place, or certainly the only early place I ever saw the analogy with massive products was in a paper of Doidy in which he showed that the secondary obstruction was carried by the Lie analog oh, of a massive product. Oh, I see, yeah. And that's where it stopped. At right. that time, nobody was going on to, to higher order things. Right. Uh, Murray had indicated the form of the next thing, but there were no examples known where, you know, either you got past the first obstruction and there were no further ones for homological reasons, mm -hmm. or you couldn't get past the first one. So there was until much later. Oh, by the way, Murray and I, on and off together at Penn, for decades before we realized we were doing essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that his famous paper and my pa first paper about A infinity. Two years apart. Excuse me? They were two years apart, right? No, the same year, 1963. Oh, same. oh I see. Published in 63. You said published 61. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and it took us at right. least two decades. To be, before we realize, talk about perspective. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, one needs to s see the forest rather than just the trees, I think yeah, that's right. one of the problems. Yeah. Well, there's very few kind of fundamental ideas in mathematics, I think, and they, you know, they, they, they rise in different settings and they can be clothed in such different ensembles that they look very different. Yeah. So, 
and especially if they're just written as formulas, mm -hmm. then you're quite likely to miss the structural comparison between the formulas. And even worse, if they're old-fashioned physics with centipede tensor calculus. <laughs> I think that was Flanders' phrase, centipede tensor calculus. Okay. Is there any sense in which the Lie algebra that is controlling? What? Is there any sense in which the Lie algebra that is controlling deformations of some kind of structure? analytic problem sure so, yeah but the one place where and the fact that it is homotopy theory is what I learned from Kasevich but you knew that Kadarva Spencer theory was basically homotopy theory in the 70s that's I'm, probably going too far but on the other hand what I did know <laughs> and this is I really think you should have told me <laughs> <laughs> the, the deformations of complex structure had as a crucial ingredient I don't know all the details that there's a differential. That's what's being deformed. You have a the, oh, the D bar is being the deformed. The D bar is being deformed. I see. And it's in that sense that okay. all the other examples, there's a differential that's being deformed. Okay. That's what I learned first from Mike before thinking of it as oh, being from controlled Mike. by we that from Mike Schlesinger. Okay, yeah. but, uh, I see. A differential being deformed, so therefore yeah. ergo. Right. So we have about three minutes. Oh, I'd just like okay. to talk, touch very briefly sure. and not do it justice at all on the role of stringy ideas in, the work, in both of your work. So string topology and uh, string field theories. Right. Go ahead. One minute. Okay. One minute. <laughs> just to say that the way I look at it, appearance in string field theory is that you think of the strings as maps of the circle in the closed case and the interval in the open case, and you look at functions on the space of all such strings, mm -hmm. and then you have a convolution product, because given a... Like on a interval, group. Yeah. Excuse me? Like on a group. Exactly like yeah. on a group. All the ways that an interval can be split into two. Mm -hmm. The slight difference, which is really remarkable, and due to Swiebach in the, in the closed case, where you have a circle, you don't pinch it, you put a diameter across in all possible ways. Mm -hmm. And use that as Convolve, your kind of come average off. over that. Right. Uh -huh. So back to your one minute. Well, I mean, you hear strings are, you know, particles may be real little strings and they come together and come together like this and they form Riemann surfaces and stuff. And I said, well, I thought, well, how do I make little strings interact? And so, well, one way to make strings interact, like in three space, how do you make them interact? I mean, they don't touch mm -hmm. each other. But if they're like this, Mm -hmm. Like if they're linked, mm -hmm. and if you deform one off, mm -hmm. so if you have one parameter family of strings, then it has to interact with the other string for topological reasons. So the idea was take all families of strings and try to write down all forced topological interactions. That's string topology.
And I mm -hmm. think the example he just gave with this one parameter which has to intersect mm -hmm. goes back to Gauss. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. He had a formula for it. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Great. Well, I'm sorry we couldn't do more justice to the stringy notions, but it's been very enlightening, and thank you very much for your participation in this interview. Well, thank you for moderating it. It was fun a answering questions from you. Yes. Thank you. Great fun. Okay.